All right, well, um, let's begin by reading a passage, um, our text this evening from uh, Acts chapter 4. Again, this is a passage we've looked at a, a couple of times in the past, but a very encouraging passage that reminds us that there is uh, power, there is strength, there is uh, encouragement that is available to us through the Holy Spirit, but what we need to do is we need to seek Him, we need to ask for these mercies uh, in order that we might receive them. Uh, let me be, the text is verse 31, but let me begin reading back in verse uh, 23, and I'd like to read through verse uh, 33. So beginning in verse 23, and this is in the context of Peter and John having healed the lame man at the temple, uh, Peter having preached to the great crowd that gathered, uh, they're being arrested because of the commotion that this created, and um, then having been examined, cross-examined by the, uh, the Sanhedrin, uh, the council, uh, threatened and then released, and what they did following that, uh, what they didn't do was say, well... I guess we're not being received. I guess people are going to resist this, uh, you know, this message and they're not going to receive us, so we'll just give up. Uh, or from what they've threatened, uh, you know, it's not safe for us to go out and do this anymore, so uh, we should just um, basically um, go somewhere else. But what they did was they sought the Lord, prayed and asked for grace, and the Lord answered their prayer. Verse 23 and when they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats, and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend, extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when uh, they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them, and with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. Well, may the Lord encourage us through this um, passage of Scripture um, this evening. Now, again, we've been considering uh, today that, and really over the last uh, couple of weeks, that our lives, as we've seen, need to be different, different from the Jews in the wilderness, different from many who profess faith in the Lord Jesus today. We need to have a devotion that goes beyond theirs, a devotion not to ourselves and not to our own pleasure, at least outside of the pleasure that we would get from serving the Lord, but devotion to the Lord's pleasure. Now, we've seen what it is that pleases Him. Uh, what pleases Him is that we love Him most of all and that we uh, devote ourselves to Him by listening to and living by His Word and that we aim uh, for His glory in everything that we do. Now, this morning, we saw that perhaps the greatest thing that we can do in order to bring glory to the Lord and pleasure to Him is to seek after His lost sheep. Now, again, Jesus knew this. This is why Jesus came into the world. We read in Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He said on another occasion, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, knowing these things is the reason why Paul did what he did. And again, Whitfield, Edward, Spurgeon throughout history, why they devoted themselves to this same cause. 
And this is also why, as, as I was making mention at the beginning, why the, uh, the burden of the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray is focused on this very thing. It's focused on evangelism. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 10, when you pray, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's essentially a prayer that God's name would be reverenced, to be treated as holy everywhere in the world, that his kingdom would continue to advance, and as it does, that people would bow the knee to the Lord Jesus, even as uh, Jesus tells us, uh, well, actually in the Psalms, that the Father has given him that promise as he sits at his right hand until basically all of his enemies are subdued under his feet. Now, we're a part of that, which is why our Lord Jesus wants us to pray for it. We need to pray for it. We need to work towards it. Now, this evening, I want us to consider where we are going to find the resources to be able to do this. I mean, where are we going to find the strength? Where are we going to find the ability? Well, we're only going to find them in the same place the disciples found it as they began to carry out the great commission that Jesus gave to them and the same commission that was passed on to us. We're only going to find it in the promised Holy Spirit. Now, in the book of Acts, you know, we, we do see a transformation in the lives of the disciples. We first see the disciples waiting in Jerusalem, as Jesus had told them, until the Father had sent the promise uh, of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, it, it transformed them. Uh, he became like fire in their souls. The Holy Spirit energized them with a holy zeal and affection for the Lord's glory and for His gospel essentially swallowed up their lives in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see on the day of Pentecost that the Spirit of God gave them a new ability to declare the gospel. You know, I don't think we often think about this, but the gift that He gave them to speak in these differing languages was essentially a sign to unbelieving Israel that what was going on was actually from the Lord as they spoke in the languages of all the Jews that had gathered for the day of Pentecost to celebrate that feast as they declared the wonderful works of God in their languages. Now, on that day, Peter also, uh, who previously we know had cowered in the darkness, preached in the power of the Holy Spirit before a great congregation, and the Lord used that sermon to convert over 3,000 people. After Peter and John healed the man, as I was making mention earlier, who had been crippled from birth, Peter again preached to the crowd who had gathered by the Spirit's power, and 5,000 more were brought savingly into the kingdom of heaven. When they were arrested for doing this miracle and drawing this, cloud, or this crowd and examined by the Sanhedrin, uh, they stood their ground and they courageously testified about the Lord Jesus Christ how he was the Messiah. And you know, the leaders didn't like to hear this because they knew that they had crucified Jesus Christ. And now here they are filling Jerusalem with the idea that, that they had crucified the Messiah. When the council commanded them uh, no longer to teach or preach in the name of Jesus in Jerusalem, Peter plainly told them they must obey God rather than men. They had to tell others what they had seen and what they had heard. After they had threatened Peter and John further, the, the council released them. And after they rejoined the other disciples, they prayed for continued grace to preach Christ. And Luke writes in our text in Acts 4, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, the question we're asking this evening is essentially this, where are we going to find the resources that we need to do what the Lord calls us to do, to be this kind of powerful witness? Well, we're not going to find that strength uh, within ourselves. We don't have that ability. We don't have that power any more than we had the power to come to Jesus in the first place. We're only going to find this power in the Lord's Spirit. Now, the first thing we need to realize is that uh, unlike the apostles, we don't have to wait for the day of Pentecost to come. 
because it has already come. We don't need another Pentecost. Uh, the day has already come. The promised spirit has already been given. He's already been poured out upon the church uh, to move this work forward. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ told them not to go out in their own strength. Don't get started until you receive this power. And when you receive this power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the furthest most reaches of the world. That spirit has already been given. The work has been moving forward since that day. And that uh, ability, that resource, that spirit is still available to us today. As a matter of fact, we have had it. We have had that resource. We've had the spirit. Since the time the spirit sovereignly united himself with us, and became within us that life-giving principle in our souls that originally brought us to Jesus in the first place. In other words, we have had the ability given to us from that moment forward. And really, He is all we need. Now, I've been tempted, as I'm sure others who have read about the great revivals that have taken place in the past, to think that in order for us to get the power we need, what we need is another revival. Uh, such as the revival that took place during the time of the Reformation or uh, an era, uh, perhaps a time that I, I think I find to be most fascinating, uh, the first and second great awakenings that took place within this country or the New York revival of 1858 when the Lord poured out much more of His Spirit than He normally does. And certainly those times are great blessings and it would be wonderful the Lord would send them again. Although Jonathan Edwards reminds us that when the kingdom of heaven exerts itself in the way that it did during the times of the revivals, uh, the kingdom of Satan also uh, exerts itself in retaliation. We don't need revival in order for uh, the resources that we need to do this work. We have had these resources from the time that we were born again. So we don't need revival, although we should pray for it. What we do need to do, though, is to seek for more of the uh, Spirit, to seek the Lord for more of His Spirit, as the disciples did in our passage. Uh, we need to want more of the Spirit. Okay? Think about the disciples' situation. Think about their experience. Think about their hearts. They love the Lord, particularly after the Spirit of God filled them. Okay? They loved the Lord and they wanted to glorify Him. They were willing to do whatever they had to do in order to move His work forward. Uh, we need to have that desire, and we do have that desire by the Holy Spirit. We need conviction, the same conviction they had that the Lord actually calls us to reach the lost. I mean, this, this isn't something that is a good idea to do. This is something the Lord has commanded us to do to reach out to those without Christ. We need to be convicted. We need to know for sure that that's what He's told us to do. We need faith to believe, as they did, that what the Lord uh, says will happen to the unbelieving if we don't reach out to them with the gospel will, in fact, happen to them. They will go down into hell if they perish without Jesus Christ. And we need, again, that love of the Holy Spirit, which He has given to us to care enough to do something about it. The disciples had these things, and we have these things. But there is something perhaps that we need that also comes out of this love more than perhaps these other things, and that is we need courage, because this is exactly what the disciples were praying for, because that's what the Spirit of God gives. And so they prayed. They prayed that the Lord would give them the power to speak His Word with confidence, with boldness, and that in the face of the council's warnings. Remember, they warned them no longer to teach or preach in the name of Jesus Christ. And of course, there would be consequences if they did. And so in the face of this threat, they needed greater courage to continue to do what the Lord called them to do. And so we read in, in Acts 4, verse 29, as they're praying, they say, and now, Lord, take note of their threats. And grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. See, what we need is essentially the same thing. We, we feel threatened also by the world, don't we? What stands in our way 
in, in the way of our witness uh, are a couple of things that, that have to do with how we believe the world is going to respond to the message that we're bringing. If we thought everybody was going to eagerly sit down and listen to us, say, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus, and they would sit down and listen to us, so it wouldn't be so hard, would it, to talk to others? But that's not the way they're going to respond. And we're afraid of how we're going to respond when they respond the way that they will. We're either going to be embarrassed. Sometimes we're embarrassed by the gospel because we know the world believes the gospel to be foolishness. The world is steeped in atheism in the idea of evolutionary theory, that we all came about here by, purely by accident. Uh, we know that there is the prevailing attitude of political correctness. And we're afraid that if we speak the truth, that we're going to appear either foolish or maybe bigoted in the eyes of the world. Or maybe just simple fear is stopping us from speaking to other people. The fear of how people are going to react to us and when they begin to argue against us, arguing their position, that we're not going to be able to hold our own uh, against them. We need to pray as the disciples prayed for courage. We need to pray for the courage the Spirit of God gives. We need to pray for the kind of love the Spirit gives that casts out all fear, that we might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we also, as they need to believe, we need to trust that the Lord will hear and He will answer our prayer, because we know this is something that the Lord has promised to give us, the Spirit of God. If, if you being evil, Jesus said on one occasion to His disciples, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You know, the Lord has more than, than promised uh, to give us the Spirit of God if we ask. He's actually commanded us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we read in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Paul says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, when Paul said that, he didn't mean, don't, just don't be inebriated. But what he meant by, by this was don't be under the influence of anything other than the Holy Spirit. Whatever captures our hearts, whatever we love the most, basically we are filled with. Uh, and what we need to be filled with is the Spirit of God. Now, as I've said, if we belong to the Lord, we essentially already have the Holy Spirit. We already have all of these things that, that we need. We have this, this faith. We have this love. We have something of this courage. But we also know that that's going to be stronger or weaker depending upon how much we are filled with the Spirit's influence. You would think with the kind of boldness that, that Peter and John exhibited in front of the council, the last thing that they would need would be greater boldness. But they realized they still would not be able to do what they needed to do apart from the Lord's grace. And so believing they needed the Spirit's help and believing that God would give them this help, as Jesus had promised, they prayed. And the Lord answered their prayer. And we see Luke write in Acts 4.31, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now again, the Lord isn't going to answer this prayer unless we're ready to do something for His glory, unless we're ready and willing to begin to reach out. We can, you know, we, sometimes we, we feel like... Um, if the Lord will just zap me and fill me with this desire and this courage, then I'll go right out and I'll do this. But it isn't until we've already purposed in our hearts by the grace He's given us to do these things that He gives us the additional strength we need actually to carry them out. But if we are intent on doing this, if this is what we really want to do, and we pray and ask the Lord for His grace to do it, He will answer our prayers. He is faithful to do this. Now, again, we, we've heard these things before, but what I'd like us to do is just step, step back for a minute and, and just have us look at our lives and, and see how we're doing in these areas. If, if we had a spiritual gas gauge, you know, on, on our souls that we could look at, uh, uh, how, would we, how would we see ourselves? How full are we of the Spirit of God? How can we really tell how full we are? 
Well, the things that we see ourselves doing for the Lord or not doing for the Lord, the love that we have in our hearts for the Lord or perhaps the lack of that love, the commitment, the time we're spending, all of these things are various indicators of how much we have of the Spirit of God in us because the more we have of Him, the more devoted we're going to be to the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we look at our spiritual gas gauge, uh, how full are we? You know, are we, are we empty? Are we full? Are we somewhere in between? I think we're all somewhere in between, of course, if we have the Spirit of God. But the question we need to ask is, why aren't we fuller than we are? Why don't we have more of the Spirit of God? Well, the answer is we have failed to do what the Lord has called us to do in order to get more of the Spirit's help. We haven't devoted ourselves and improved. You know, the way the Puritans would put it is, God gives us a certain amount of grace, and that grace is going to help us do what the Lord calls us to do, but we need to use what He's given us before He's going to give us more. So how do we need to use the grace He's already given us to, give, to get more? Well, we need to use it to basically allow the Lord to draw us away from the world and to get alone with Him in order to have communion with Him. I was trying to find the uh, quote that Donna had uh, given me a little while ago about R.C. Sproul and what his recommendation was as far as how much time we should spend with the Lord uh, every day. I think it was either one or two hours. He believed that that's how much time we should spend with the Lord every day to get the strength we need. I think I've mentioned numerous times before that Luther apparently spent two hours in prayer every morning. And when he had a lot to do on, on his plate during the day, he would spend three hours in prayer with the Lord. People that are filled with the Spirit spend time with the Lord. Uh, Jonathan Edwards writes uh, this, and this comes out of his religious affections. And so uh, he says these things basically to tell us what our lives should look like if, if we are genuine believers. Uh, and I think we're going to find that it falls short of what he says here, but this is what we ought to be aiming at. But Edwards writes this in his religious affections. He says, a true Christian doubtless delights in religious fellowship and Christian conversation and finds much to affect his heart in it. In other words, he likes to get together with other believers. Uh, fellowship in the church, uh, public worship. But he also delights at times to retire from all mankind to converse with God in solitary places. And this also has its peculiar advantages for fixing his heart and engaging its affections. True religion disposes persons to be much alone in solitary places for holy meditation and prayer. So it wrought in Isaac, Genesis 24, 63, and which is much more, so it wrought or it worked in Jesus Christ. How often do we read of his retiring to mountains and solitary places for holy converse with his Father? The only way we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit is if we spend time alone with the Lord. And it's more than just knocking out your chapters of the Bible you know, with the uh, McShane reading program where you read four chapters a day or even are reading the Bible together because we can read those chapters, we can look for facts, we can look for interesting things, but that's different than letting the Lord speak to you through the Word, having communion with Him, asking Him to show you things in the Word of God, uh, to teach you what it is He wants you to do, maybe to reprove you of things that you're doing you shouldn't be doing, and to, uh, just to get to know Him more intimately. That's what we ought to be seeking after in our time with the Lord and praying uh, for strength. So to have this kind of strength, we first of all need to devote ourselves to private worship, private communion with the Lord. More time with the Lord equals more like the Lord. Uh, we also haven't devoted ourselves to public worship as we should. Um, now I'm preaching to the choir because we're here in public worship, you know, so... The ones who need to hear this are the ones maybe who could have been here who aren't here this evening. Now, we need to remember what we're doing here. Uh, we're, we're gathered together to please the Lord. We're gathered together to worship and, and honor Him. 
This is his day. This is his meeting. This is where he calls his people together to glorify him. And it's not so much that he needs it as much as we need it. Uh, It's here that the Lord tells us that he has basically chosen to pour out his spiritual blessings, to pour out his Holy Spirit on us if we seek him during this time. Again, if we go through the motions just like we can in our private devotions, if we just go through the motions, we're not going to get anything out of this. But if we really seek to connect with the Lord, to have communion with Him, uh, to worship Him and to, to honor Him, the Lord will fill us. He will bless us. By the way, He, he will bless us each time we meet together for uh, this, this kind of study and, and this is particularly prayer, which is a plug for the Wednesday uh, study as well. Now, um, another reason why we're not as full as we might otherwise be is once we have gained these influences of the Holy Spirit, we can just as easily lose these things by doing things that the Lord tells us we shouldn't be doing, by sinning against Him. We can essentially poke holes in our tank and this grace can flow out of us uh, when we offend the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit withdraws from us. And when He does, that sanctifying power that we're after, that we need to do what what the disciples did, it leaves with Him. He's the only one who can give us this power. And so we need to make sure we hold on to it. Now, we need to believe that there really is spiritual power that is available to us through the Holy Spirit. And we need to seek after that power. You know, sometimes we think our Lord Jesus Christ was, uh, was able to live the kind of life that He lived because He's a divine person. And we think of, of really the man Christ Jesus as the God-man Christ Jesus, as, as basically God in human flesh, which He is, but we need to realize He's fully man. The personality is divine. But what is it that gave Him the power to do what it is He did? Well, it was the Holy Spirit and His presence, His anointing in His life. John the Baptist says of Jesus in John 3, verse 34, For He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for He gives the Spirit without measure. And the idea we believe here is is that the, the Father gives the Son the Spirit above measure. Jonathan Edwards believes that that's what essentially creates the union between the divine and human uh, persons, or should, not persons, but, but natures, and what unites, as it were, these two natures to the one person is the Spirit of God, but it's the Spirit of God who gives him the words of God and the power to live and to be what it is that the Father has called him to be. Also why, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ could never fail to be what, what he was. It was the Spirit who made all the difference in the lives of the disciples, as we saw earlier on. Remember, Peter was hiding before Pentecost, afraid the Jews were going to find him and take him out and do the same thing to him that they did to Jesus. But after the Spirit came, publicly, in front of, his, of, of, of the enemies who crucified Jesus Christ, he preached to thousands and testified about Jesus in the face of those who wanted to kill him. It gave him great courage. Paul was traveling to Damascus in order to arrest and imprison and execute everyone he could find that belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. But after the Spirit of God came into his life, he did everything he could to convince everyone he knew and even those he didn't to become Christians. The Spirit gave George Whitfield not only the desire, but the power to preach to the conversion of thousands. We, we saw that a couple of uh, Lord's Days ago. The Spirit of God not only gifted but moved Jonathan Edwards to use all of his intellectual powers both to defend and preach the gospel. You know, it's interesting that virtually everything that Jonathan Edwards wrote was aimed at the conversion of whoever would read, whoever would listen. Uh, He was defending the gospel to make sure that people weren't holding on to a false gospel that couldn't save them. He, He would try to correct them, and everything he was preaching was to convict and to convert. And the reason why he did that was because the Spirit of God was filling his heart and giving him the desire that others might be saved. And of course, we're all familiar with Spurgeon, uh, who with the Spirit's influence devoted his life to the conversion of the lost. 
I think, you know, as we, as we conceive of the gospel, every time you pick up Spurgeon and read him, you see the gospel plainly uh, communicated there with the hope and the conviction that there would be those who would hear the, the master's voice and would be converted through that ministry. Now, again, the, all of these relied on the Spirit of God to give them the strength and the courage to do what they could not do on their own. And if we rely on the Holy Spirit, if we look to Him also for the strength and this courage, we may not necessarily do everything that these other giants have done. I mean, they were somewhat unique, especially, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ in the history of the church. We may not do uh, as much. We may not do as great things as they did. But we can be sure of one thing. We'll certainly do more and we'll do much better than we would do without the Spirit's help. Paul writes this in Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. We need to look to the Spirit of God for the power in order to glorify Him, particularly in this most important work, but this most difficult and intimidating work of reaching out to others with the gospel. Don't try to do it in your own strength, but spend time with the Lord and let His heart develop in yours and then reach out with a real love and concern for the lost and a real desire to serve and honor the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's when you'll see people coming to Jesus. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to give us grace to do that.